Recording in progress. Good day, good night, all. Welcome back. Another special guest, and we're not across the pond. I've got someone a lot more local today. Someone in the UK, Paul. Please introduce yourself to the audience, and welcome to the broadcaster. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Paul Stobbs. Um, I run a YouTube channel called Understanding Conspiracy. And uh, I'm a bit of what you call a, a scattershot conspiracy theorist. I've kind of been in this game for maybe about just over a decade. I started the channel in 2014. Um, and I've kind of become, well, the guy known for popularizing a theory, well, creating a theory called uh, the Nephilim look like clowns. And uh, currently it's spreading far and wide and uh, the interest is kind of getting into it. And uh, most of my channel these days is is focused on spreading this idea, this um, this concept that the modern day clown is just a a purposefully invented symbol by secret societies to venerate demons, basically, in a nutshell. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, you know, there's um, that's me summed up. That's the elevator pitch right there. But I, I, like I said, I, I talk about anything and everything on the channel. Um, I'm I've done my research. I've been in the uh, the game for a while, you know. Um, all the occult knowledge, all the symbolism, all that kind of thing is kind of down pat. Um, I like to get into the philosophical side of things. I like to veer off the path a little bit, you know, and uh, get speculative about a lot of stuff to do with the spirit realm, DMT, uh, just general philosophy. And uh, yeah, you know, I've I've got a nice little community online. It's growing. It's it's strong. And right now, I'm doing the podcast circuit. So here I am. This is it. This is it. So how how are you finding the, the quote unquote community of sorts? Because it can be a little cutthroat at times. Is everybody <laughs> welcoming you with open arms, kind of thing? Well, me, I've I've been like I said, I'm, this isn't my first rodeo. You know, I've been doing this for years. Um, yeah, and I myself, you know, I've made many videos critiquing the truth of community in a way even though I'm a, I'm a member of it i see our flaws i see the characters that kind of make us yes. look look bad and i try and i try and you know i have sections on my channel dedicated to basically trying to help people who, who are waking up for lack of a better term cope with it because unfortunately most people who start to learn the the harsh truths of reality that have been hidden from them they usually start going a bit crazy and it's not uncommon for them to then kind of uh go mouthing off to the family and friends trying to get them to wake up in kind of a, an erratic way you know and it ends up pushing people away and isolating them rather than waking other people up and um i, th I find a lot of people you know in the truth community do get hyper focused on certain topics as well and get a bit obsessive and all in all i just don't think any of that behavior is conducive to actually a healthy community that helps anybody so i try and point that out quite a lot whenever possible and i also try and give tips and advice on how to better deal with learning these things so you don't lose all your friends and family and you don't become an outcast weird or alienated person who uh you know is, is detached from reality and no longer grounded so that, you know, I, I try to lead by example Yes. Um, but in terms of the community reacting to my theory, there's always going to be those people who send me the worst, horrible, most vile messages in the world. And I, I've always had them. So it's it's war off my back, you know. Um, but no, the, I would say 99% of people who follow my work are very receptive and, and lovely. Amazing people, like I said. And I have an amazing community of uh, uh, f people who help me every day, you know, with ideas and just support. And it's a, it's a great community. I can't lie that I've built and um, networked over the years. I have a Telegram group that which people can join uh, by the name of Understanding Conspiracies, about just shy of 300 people in there now. And honestly, it's an, it's an amazing conversation every day. People sharing their own experiences, their own journeys, you know, and I, I love I love a good uh, coming to the truth journey story. I really do. Oh, yes, yes. And I think I think that's where I think that's a good point to start in reference to your your starting journey in regards to Le Truth, as the Francais would say. <laughs> um, what was your spot? was the turning point where you started to stir a little bit in the bed and start to think, mm, let, let me come out of this dream state. What was that, that, that point for you? <sighs> I know this sounds cliche, but I've, I've always kind of been a bit out, a bit of an outsider. Um, yeah. I've never really not been observant if that's the, the good starting point for someone who's naturally going to wake up. I'm an artist by by nature. 
I've always drawn. I've always, I've always been the quiet kid who just drew happily in the corner. I was every parent's dream. You know what I mean? And I was, I was always, I was always in my own imagination trying to make sense of the world at all times, you know? And I, I, I grew up as a child loving the beauty in nature and the intricacies of, of this, this amazing creation as I see it now, you know? Um, so I've always kind of been one as growing up to want to try and explore that deeper and to understand the, the nature of reality in all its facets, spiritually and physically, you know? So, you know, I grew up, I grew up rel uh, relatively atheistic initially, maybe through, through, um, a, just a lack of religious example or spiritual example. It was never, okay. it was never a thought originally, you know? Um, and I kind of developed kind of a um, a hatred, a typical edgy teenage hatred towards religion, thinking it's the most possible thing in the world, you know, and, and you know, trying to basically say anyone who believes in, in a sky daddy is an idiot type of attitude, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then as I got older into like, say, my late teens, um, I was kind of getting heavily into cannabis use. Okay. Um, smoking every day, you know, eight joints a day for eight years, it ended up being um and basically going down the the, the route of being like a, a new age hippie i suppose you'd call it consciousness yeah. consciousness exploration um you know trying to trying to reach new dimensions through the use of psychedelics that type of world became my life you know and um all through college what so go what, ahead. Inspired, what inspired that paul what 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 led you down the psychedelic path it was it's hard to say because it I was so high that I kind of forgot most of my past, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, if if I really go far back, when I was sixteen, I, I had this, I had friends, you know, and we were always kind of questioning all things in reality. I'd always had these these really close two friends, um, who and we called ourselves the Brain Trust because we we would just literally spend every night in my in my brick shed smoking weed and just drinking wine and just talking. You know, we're not about yeah. just not about just trivial nonsense about our own personal yeah. lives. Really getting the hard, trying to answer the hard questions about morality and 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 reality and what it means to be a person and with different personalities who interact with the world and what the right way to to be in the world is type of thing. And it was kind of always just a logical next step to explore other realms if possible. You know, if that's true, we need to test it. Are they actually there? You know, so it was kind of like a scientific method type thing. But we got our, hand, our hands on salvia. I was, only, I was only 16, maybe 17 at this time. You know, I was in college in my first year of like college type of thing, just fresh out of high school. And um, I did salvia because it's about at the time, you know, we're talking, we're talking about 15, pretty old 15 years ago now, you know, I'm, I, forget I'm 30, I forget I'm 31 now, you know, but it, yeah, it, back in the time, salvia, you could just get it over the counter in a head shop, you know what I mean? It wasn't... Um, it's not illegal or anything. It was just there, ready. You could just get it, you know, and it was cheap. And it's more powerful than DMT. You know, I didn't even know this at the time, but it's it's the most powerful psychedelic on the earth. <laughs> like, and it was kind of one of those. So I was, we were hitting it hard, you know. We did our research on how to do it proper, and we did it proper, you know. And we we took the three hits and we held them in, type of thing. And we yeah, we just went with it and we just tried to see what would happen. And um, I watched my friend do it first, and he was laughing hysterically he was telling me there was little people running across his hands and he was it was just my he could tell he, he was blown away by what he was witnessing you know this was uh yeah. and he was like the logistical atheistic scientific mind of us all you know and even he was like well, what is this I, I don't know what's going on you know i've always been more of the uh the open-minded artsy type yeah. person you know so i was more susceptible and probably to to believe anything <laughs> but um he wasn't you know he and even he was like i don't know what that was I don't know what I saw. All I know is it was real. You know, it was that kind of attitude. And then when I did it, you know, I, I actually had a really terrifying bad experience. Um, we did record it at the time. <laughs> and uh, if I remember correctly, it's long gone now because obviously we got rid of all these things when people grew up and wanted to get into uh, jobs, you know, things like that. But I, but I, I, but I, I do remember, like, um, I basically just said, no. And that's it. I'm gone. I'm silent for 10 minutes, just staring into the void, melted into the bed. You know what I mean? And I'm like he breathing heavily, sweating profusely, kind of my body's convulsing back and forth. And I just go on a bad trip for like for what feels like an eternity, you know? And I remember basically going through a vortex into this other world and 
and maybe it wasn't actually that scary in retrospect but for you know for a 16 17 year old going to going to another dimension i was overwhelmed i couldn't i couldn't cope with that reality shattering experience you know and it, it i was never the same afterwards but um it didn't discourage me i went harder after that my other friends didn't i, I went off to university after this you know not long after i, I did salvia a couple more times and i just laughed like a hyena um but it's like it's a weird laughter because you can't stop you try to stop and because you can't stop you panic that but you're still laughing you're um, laughing and it's not a laughter of joy it's a laughter of pain eventually because you can't stop laughing and you want to so hard that it it, it you say it, it border it borders wailing in pain rather than laughter do you get what i mean it, it kind of crosses that boundary and it's hard there's very little between fear and fear and laughter you find you know what i mean <laughs> when you're actually in that yeah. mode but um that's my second experience with it and i felt like i kind of felt like i was being possessed to be honest looking back that was a very bizarre experience you know but uh yeah Did you see the, the prototypical little elves i that saw people talk about? i saw a lot of things i saw life in everything including the wallpaper <laughs> you know it was everything was alive everything was moving everything was in a in a sense um, a consciousness of sorts you know it was uh and i suppose in a way i did see life forms if you could call it that but they weren't anything akin to what you could consider something in the real world you know it was okay it's, it's you're completely detached it's, it's it's beyond our language to explain i think for good reason yeah. you know it's yeah. um, you have to experience it kind of thing unfortunately as horrible and, and mundane as that sounds yes <laughs> you know? yeah. and i'm not encouraging anybody i'm not encouraging anybody to go out and do these things now you know this is this is a different time for me you know this was a different worldview um sorry go ahead i interrupted you there no 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 it, it makes perfect sense and as you say you were you're a young adolescent at the time searching and, and and trying to find yourself and yeah questions and you've got questions you're trying to find the answer so it makes sense that you're gonna grow and develop spiritually emotionally um knowledge base wise based upon a 15 year time time um, gap so no it, it makes total sense what you're saying that's what i mean yeah so again by this point you know i wasn't anywhere close to a conspiracy thinker you know i wasn't in that world it was i wasn't quote unquote awake you know what i mean if you want to call it anything or anything close to close to the christian version of saved you know it's um i was yeah i was i was a lost individual you know and i was quite i'm not gonna lie you know i, I don't like who i was then looking back you know i was uh i was big-headed i was egotistical i was um you know i was cruel and in what respects um i could enact revenge on people who did me wrong quite easily without any second thought things like that you know yeah. i i i didn't care about other people so much as myself um i suppose you could consider it more narcissistic in a sense or maybe all maybe all teenagers are narcissistic they're thinking about it. i don't really know but <laughs> I don't. I don't like who I was. I had a lot of enemies. I, I was one of those personalities. And maybe I still am. I don't know. But um, you either like me, or you really, really hate me. It's one of the two, you know. And I rarely find people who are just passive or indifferent towards my character. I don't know why. I wish people would be more passive sometimes. But uh, it's either one of the two. Either they like me and they get on with me and they think I'm a nice guy, or they just hate me. And I kind of. I've always had that issue. Um, and. It, I kind of learned this thing, I kind of realized after a while, you know, growing up, it's kind of, if everyone in the room is calling you a dickhead, you're probably a dickhead, you know, and <laughs> I, had to do, I had to do a lot of retrospective thought, you know, and, and, and growing basically, and, you know. That's brave though, Paul, yeah. that is very brave to, to face, to, to, to not only be aware of the room, you know, when people say read the room, but then to actually address it like shit, maybe I'm a ticket. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. What, what, what parts of my personality do I need to tone down, or uh, and then hype up other parts of my personality to balance this out? Because ultimately, we're it's about balance. It's yeah. about having the good with a little bit of bad, you know, a little bit of pain with a little bit of with a little bit of joy. You know, we've got to balance these things out. Um, absolutely. I mean. I was a bit of a, I was a bit of a, what you call a player in a sense, <laughs> you know what I mean? And 
Um, I just, I didn't care about who I hurt along the way as well. A lot of that stuff was going on, you know, and, and maybe a lot of it was growing from some kind of feeling of inadequacy because I was butt bullied in high school for being a bit of a loser, a fat weirdo, you know, and then as I got older and better looking and th I was in the best shape of my life at that age, you know what I mean? It's kind of, it, things change, you know what I mean? And maybe it went all to my head, I don't know. But um, anyway, I went to university and it was quite a shocking change of, of pace because suddenly I was a nobody, you know having to start again in a new city is that kind of coming of age story, you know, and you've got to try and find your yes. place in it. Um, so I think I learned a lot then, you know, and a lot, a lot of, um, I had to do a lot of retrospective thinking then because um, for a short period of time, I had to be sober because I didn't have any connections to get the cannabis. I was so heavily addicted to in this new city, you know, and it's kind of I had to kind of, start again yeah and and you do start thinking again you know you're looking out the window while it's raining just you know and getting those deep thoughts type of thing <laughs> but as, as time went on i very quickly fell back into who i originally was and i got in the same crowd you know i found the drug scene quite quickly and um it was during this YouTube. yeah it was, smoke, uh, you know yeah. Smoke, uh, you know yeah, i made my connections quickly yeah you know what city um did you go to university wise uh, lincoln Lincoln. Yeah, yeah. Very small town, markety kind of town. Oh, it is. It's very small, but uh, that that's that's made things easy, you know. <laughs> in a sense, uh, you knew everybody, you know, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and either you're in that world or you're not in that world, and it's a dark world when you're in it. But when you're in it, you don't see it as being dark. You see it as being something colorful and wonderful and amazing and like a, a tight, a tight close knit community, just like, you know, any community you can get involved with. But, uh, you know, I found my connections. I got my cannabis and I also got into the, uh, the MDMA scene as well. There was a few cocaine connections knocking about as well, but I wasn't so heavy into that. I was more into the consciousness stuff, you know, and yeah. I was looking for people who could get me the, uh, you know, get me the, the psychedelics, the mushrooms, the LSD, the tabs, you know? Yeah. Um, and I got them, I got them, rapidly you know and I, I i got to a point where um i was microdosing quite a lot uh through my like my my first and second years even towards the end of the university as well i was studying fine art you know, right next to the cathedral funnily enough so that was an amazing experience and... imagine especially tripping right next to that bloody cathedral <laughs> yeah but i think this is the thing i was never i was rarely actually in the studio um where all the other art students were busy at work because for me I, I'm, again, I'm not. I'm not trying to brag when I say this, but I never really felt like I had to work very hard in art to get where I wanted to be. Okay. Um, I've always kind of just breezed through high school and college, getting the top marks, and I never really felt like I did any work. Um, mm. And I, I would watch other people staying after after class in extra hours to try and just barely scrape by, you know. And because I was good in it, and because I loved the work, it never felt like work, you know. Um, and I. I, I never really bothered going to many lectures or classes. I turned up to do enough that needed to be done, and I still left with a two one in the end. You know, I spent cool. yeah, I spent most of my time getting high and busy doing my own thing. And and this channel, funnily enough, was the end result of my entire university um thing. It was my my end of year project. Um, it was my final show because this is the thing, right? But as, as twenty twelve was coming around the end of the world talk was happening about about, uh, you know, about the mayan calendar and this is the period i was at uni to 2011 to 2014 so this caught my attention you know as somebody who was already into the new age uh i don't know sacred geometry stuff you know what i mean uh, all the numerology yeah. stuff and all the uh seeing the connection yeah all that all all of it you know as an artist a lot of my artwork was was basically using sacred geometry to make flower of life mandala patterns all over the place and you know, I was kind of just digging that style at the time and that kind of that world, you know, and that fit that way of thinking. So I was kind of become a, a heavy Gnostic. I was never much of a hippie because I've just never been that, like that. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I actually worked at Lush. That was my first job. You know, Lush, the soap shop. Yeah, right. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. that was my first job as a 16 year old. I got fired for not being Lushy enough. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> after a couple of years so basically i didn't have dreadlocks i wasn't hippie enough for their liking you know what i mean but but i was but a lot of people assumed i was that kind of guy so I, I didn't go down the new age crystal chakra power alignment stuff i went more into the mystic occult gnostic stuff you know um i wanted to know get to the deep roots and the esoteric understanding of things rather than the the 
how can this make my life better with reading the tarot cards type of thing? I wasn't into that, you know. Um, I wasn't interested in getting getting in touch with things like Ascended Masters or whatever on that side or Ancestor Spirits. I, I was more about being as, as objective as possible, you know, about the situation and, and not trying to apply things to what I was seeing that could be could warp my perception of them. You know, I didn't want any preconceived ideas. And so, yeah. like I said, I, there was a lot of things happening at this time in my life. You know, I was I was heavily, I was basically in the psychedelic realm 24-7. I was being sober was a trip, you know. I, yeah. I was yeah. always high from morning till I went to sleep. I was always smoking weed, which is a minor psychedelic, you know, and it, it puts you in a state in a place that isn't the reality that you should be in. It's not the reality everyone else is in, you know, it's kind of like, a, it makes waking life feel like you're in a dream essentially. Uh, yeah. But then, then microdosing in between, you know, trying to explore different levels of, of piercing that veil or seeing the design within nature and, and everything through the geometry and making artwork about it. And I, I kind of had this thing in the background about this end of the world stuff and it caught my attention. And I ended up watching loads of videos about predictions about what's going to happen in 2012, you know, about people were saying all sorts of things like the pole, magnetic poles are going to shift yes. and, and work worm <laughs> You know, Wormwood's going to return or something like that, or Nibiru is going to come back into our solar system. Or, yeah. And then there was the New Ages saying things like, no, 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 we're all going to ascend to the next level of the fifth dimension of consciousness, you know, and and it's everyone had their own spin on it, you know. And then you had the Christian angle saying, now it's the rapture, it's 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 the end, you know, it's the end of the world, it's Revelation's going to begin, the, 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 the beast from the bottomless pit is about to release, you know, Abaddon in Revelations. And everyone had an idea. Everyone yeah. had, a, had a perspective and it was all their own culturally, ideologically unique way of, of, of anticipating the end of whatever that's going to be, you know. Then there was These obviously... strands of DNA being formed. Oh, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You remember, you were there, clearly. you. Were, I mean, I noticed, I noticed your logo is the uh, anonymous mask, so you must have been around for a while if that's still your logo. <laughs> I, I, I um, started staring around 2002 so yeah. about a little bit of more more time on you but yeah, yeah. Your, your journey sounds quite similar quite similar of sorts i mean i was one i was wearing the anonymous mask at the time you know i was i was in that kind of crew in a way uh, oh. but it, but i was also wearing it thinking what's the danger of wearing a mask realistically what's that mean you know because when people become anonymous they don't act like themselves and i was kind of being reflective about that idea and critique I, yeah and when it's some of my early videos, I critiqued the whole movement and I'm like, Anonymous, just take off the mask. I don't think it's actually helping anybody. I did a, I did a performance piece at uni where I basically, um, I was holding a sign, well, signs that I flicked through, which were basically all the predictions for the end of the world. So Nibiru is going to come back or I was just, just, each sign had something different on it, but I was stood yeah. there wearing the Anonymous mask while doing it. And I, I noticed people weren't receptive to me at all. And my observations taught me they were actually scared of the mask. They were scared of the mask. They didn't care about what was on the board or what I was doing. I was just stood there. It's something about the mask that made people look at me in the face and cringe or like kind of look concerned or weird. Some, like a lot of people actually look scared. You know what I mean? And it made me think about this mask. Like, that's weird. You know, uh, is it really useful as a tool? Probably not. You know, I don't think it really helps get to anybody. I think it pushes them away, you know, and that was like, one of my first kind of major critiques of the truth movement at the time, you know, I mean, now I look back on anonymous and I don't really consider it um, useful in any way, shape or form, to be honest. I think it was a bit of a, a bit of a, a misleading psyop in a way, uh, you know, um, and I think there's been plenty of those type of movements since, you know, with other names. Um, but, I was there, you know, I was, I was at that level by that time of conspiracy. It was all about the 1%. It was about monetary corruption. You know what I mean? It was all about worldly stuff, earthly basic stuff. And I wasn't kind of in any way spiritual about the conspiracy stuff, but I was obviously exploring my own spirituality around this time. And, and I went on a journey just to find out why people were thinking the world was going to end. And my, my ethos was going to be something like, well, I'll just become the conspiracy theorist you know, and I will believe everything I find and just roll with it, you know, like a method acting type way. And I'll just roll with it. I'll just take everything to its logical conclusion. I'm not going to question anything. Each theory, I'm going to just go, 
go right to the end of it. Everything, you know, let's go to the full conclusion of this theory and where it leads to, you know, if you're going to take it as real. And it's like, how does that make you become doing that as well, is what my ethos was going to be. I was very psychoanalytical about what it meant to be a conspiracy theorist at the start, yeah. which is why my channel is called Understanding Conspiracy. And it's also why my logo is heavily seeped in this sacred geometry symbolism, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, there was a lot of stuff there about the symbolism you find generically in conspiracy, like the Venus, Saturn, Mars, sacred geometry, yeah. the star of Remphan, um, mm -hmm. the sun worship. It's all kind of melded into my logo. Um, and it's it's a product of that time of my journey. And so uh, yeah, time went on and I basically started to slowly realize there's actually a lot of truth in all of this, all of these theories and ideas. There really is a huge corruption type of going on. You know, there's, there's some agenda at play here and there's some nefarious actors who are pushing agendas towards something called a new world order. And it was all kind of, this isn't just, this isn't just crazy people making stuff up even though most people who try and share this information sound like crazy people making stuff up. And that's kind of what was my issue. You know, it's kind of like I eventually got to the conclusion that this is the right information. It's just in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's sad. I, I felt so much empathy and, and for, for the movement, you know what I mean? Because it's like you, I agree with everything, but I don't agree with the style of how this particular person, let's say, is trying to tell people it's not going to work, you know. You're just going to push people away. And it's kind of, I'd always had a sales background in terms of jobs. You know, I'm a cold caller at call centers. I knew how to kind of convince people to buy things they didn't really need, you know. And I picked up a thing or two in NLP and I understood, you know, people don't buy products. They don't care about the actual product itself. It's all about whether or not they trust the person selling them the product. Exactly. Yeah. People buy people. People buy people. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's kind of been one of my mantras on my channel for a while. And one of the main reasons why I try and tell people to cal just calm the fuck down. You know, if you're going to try and convince anybody of this stuff, you need to, you need to be chilled. <laughs> you know, you need yeah. to, you need to come across in a way that's calm and collected and cool because that person you're trying to convince doesn't want to end up like you if you look crazy and how do how do they avoid that well they don't listen to the information you tell them they don't believe it if i don't yeah. believe this stuff i won't end up like this crazy person in front of me you know and that's how it works and i wish it wasn't you know i wish it was easier but that's kind of the that's kind of the deal and that's the yeah. hand we've been dealt you know it's so hard. It, yeah. it's so difficult to try when you find when you quote unquote wake up and you discover that, might, as you say, there is actually an agenda. And you yeah. start to do your research and then you think, okay, you start looking into maybe the dairy industry and, and, and you know, um, the industrialization of farming. And you think, oh my God, I had no idea they were doing this stuff to the animals. And then you think to yourself, well, what change can I make myself personally? And you think, okay, well, maybe you know, lactose from a cow, you know, humans are the only ones who seem to want to drink cow's pus, you know, <laughs> after being an adult and stuff, you know, I mean, after being a child and stuff, hmm, what's the reasoning behind that? Why have they been marketing us to have drink cow pus? Like, and why are we, why are they injecting the cows with all this stuff? So then, again, you start to make decisions and, um, question your your own how can you make an effect on this industry can i start myself hmm. and then you've got so much energy and you've got so much zeal that you found out that look actually drinking milk isn't that healthy you can actually get a lot of calcium from vegetables and all the rest of the stuff you start to tell other people and you've got you i'm more healthy now i can see i have less mucus i'm, I'm less tired my, my joints are a bit better now i'm not drinking this stuff and you want to tell the world you want to tell everybody so they can potentially make an impact in their life. And that's where the issue happens. Yeah. When you've got all of this energy and all of this, like, I want to make the whole world. I want to start with my mom. I'm going to start with my dad, then my sisters, my brother, my friends. I'm going to tell everyone. Whereas, as you say, chill. <laughs> let's, let's, let's start with you first. You learn all these tools, these tricks, these ideas. You master self, and then maybe you can be the beacon of light where your where your mum will say, "Oh, I've noticed you. Your skin's looking a lot better, and you're glowing, and you've got all of this energy. What have you been doing? 
Oh, you know, I've been juicing. You remember I told you I've got that new chin injury and stuff now? Oh, yeah, you know. And by example, and just by maybe just dropping a little bit of a little gem here and a little gem there, people will come. <laughs> Build it and they will come, right? Well, you've, yeah, you've got to be the change you want to see in the world. And it's also, you know, make sure your own house is in order before you go and try and save the world type of situation. It's classic, classic advice for anybody. But we, you forget that when you're in this stuff. You very quickly... Because you kind of your whole paradigm, your whole the the structure you built your entire worldview on has kind of collapsed. So you, you're going to be in a bit of a frenzy, and I, that's why I empathise with these people so much. But yeah, again, it, you know, you need to take a step back before you start thinking about how other people are going to receive this information. And I think that's a, that's kind of a, a thought process that's often missed by a lot of truthers. They don't consider the the consequences of telling the truth because this world is is unfortunately you know, the liars are kind of in control and a lot of people benefit from the lies so the truth is a weapon and uh people don't necessarily appreciate it when you start like waving a gun in the face um and that's the kind of what you're doing you know what i mean you're uh you're threatening their preconceived uh world and ideas and ideologies and it's that's that's not actually going to be as well received as you think it is you've kind of got to give little hints in a way and lead people to to the the water and it's up to them if they want to drink at the end of the day that's you can't you can't force anybody you know um yeah yeah, yeah. i get what you're saying but in, ter in, yeah, in terms of in terms of this this story i'll try and sum up my backstory maybe we can get on to some other stuff after that but uh you know, I, the channel started rolling after university. I, I kind of, I was a bit lost. I didn't know who I was or what I was going to do with my life after university. You know, I had to come back home to Preston in the Northwest where I went, you know, and kind of start again, again, you know, and I kind of, um, you know, I had a degree. You've got, in, tools, yeah. you've got more tools in your tool belt now to start again. Kind of, you know, I, I kind of just fell into getting a job as a manager of a, well, I was a, I was a store assistant at Aldi, funnily enough. And um, I kind of just started again and, and but I, well, let's, let's rewind a bit. So just before I left uni is when I kind of started to lean towards becoming more of a Christian thinker. Um, I'd been seeped in the occult for so long and I'd been exploring these other realms for so long that I kind of, um, I, I'd burned myself out and I got nowhere. I had no answers. I didn't know any more than I did prior and I was kind of disillusioned with the new age stuff and the Gnostic thinking. I realized it's all kind of just nonsense. It's all just there to kind of keep me suppressed in a way. It's, it's bad, zero positive fruit in my life at all. It's only made me spiral further and further into depression and, and pain and misery and death. I was, I was probably dying from the heavy amounts of MDMA I'd been doing for three years, you know what I mean? And, and the rest of it. And, and my my receptors were frazzled you know i i had nothing left i couldn't think or feel like a human being anymore and it was kind of i was heavily addicted to cannabis and and the rest and you know all the alcohol that must have done some damage to me as well in those years and i was kind of at a low i was at a low point in like 2014 and um again with no direction and i kind of I'd been researching about the Christian angle to all of this stuff, all the truth of stuff, you know, and I'd never really, I'd, I'd been dipping my toes into it, you know, and I, by this point I wasn't fully like, you know, I've been listening to certain preachers and people to, telling me what Christianity is and trying to get a good idea and understanding of this worldview. And I kept noticing that most of the conspiracy rabbit holes I went down, they always end up hitting the bottom and the bottom foundation was always jesus is real and so is god and you need to start paying attention to it you know but i would always just keep bouncing back away from that and going down another rabbit hole and ne never wanting to kind of go down that one you know that big that big gaping like void yeah. void of truth i didn't i just didn't want to do it you know um i was happy with my delusions of believing i was a god just experiencing um reality through a vessel which is an aspect of everybody else is a god as well and we're all just doing the same thing forgetting that word god very zen buddhist kind of ideology you know oh, on on that note before you continue go go you see you see with that it, it says and i'm pretty sure you're aware of this it says ye are all gods little g children of the most high and then people take just that one um, scripture, not the full scripture, because at the end it says, and ye will die like men. Yeah. 
So they won't they won't put the two together because of course we are physical representations of the most high on this plane of existence. So that so the so the statement is true, but the way it's backed up is is you know, we've got a little bit of doubt there, like, oh I'm the I'm the creator. So I can physically manifest just like the most high created the, the planet. So I can create planets, moons, stars, I can do anything because I can create. No. Yeah. No. Well, it, just for more context to that verse, I believe the sons of God that they were referring to were the angels who had um, rebelled. And it's those who were gods, and now they will die like men. Um, so it wasn't even talking about human beings. Um, you know, we're not gods. And um, to be honest, we were made in the image of God. That much is true. And we, we, we messed it up. <laughs> That's basically what happened. And now we're some kind, now we're some kind of corrupted we're far removed from from the glory we originally had in the Eden, you know, and that's the whole point of needing a savior, basically. Um, but that that passage that was used to say, you know, you you're all gods, and it's kind of well, they weren't, they weren't even talking about people. This and this is the kind of level of naivety people had in that new age thinking that I even even I had about biblical knowledge. It was kind of a superficial understanding of the verse, but it was even then it was based in utter ignorance with no context, you know, and. Yeah. And that, that was enough for me at the time, because, again, I was happy believing that I was a god in a way, you know. And this is, again, a part of this, I don't like who I was at this time I was talking about earlier, you know. Um, and this comes with that natural narcissism that comes with that way of thinking, you know. Um, and, again, it was bearing me no fruits. It was not good for me. And, and like I said, I was at rock bottom after uni, and I basically asked God for help. I was like, if you're real, please save me up. I don't think I think I'm gonna die soon. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm doing well here. Um, and he did. Um, I I was taking a bath at the time at a hotel in Newcastle for a stag do for my brother-in-law, and um, I hadn't had a bath in years. I'd only ever had showers um, because we only ever lived in a place with a shower cubicle. And I inadvertently baptized myself because as soon as I asked for help and put myself under the water, I had to shoot out of the bath because just energy went through my body and into my heart, into my chest that just animated me. I had to get up, you know, and it left as soon as it came. It wasn't invasive in a way. It felt warm, you know, but it was, it was shocking because I didn't see that coming, you know, but since that day in 2014, I think it was March, I've never really been the same. Um, I haven't touched a psychedelic since I haven't, um, well, slowly, I've been losing all my addiction since then. Um, I quit cannabis in 2016, cold turkey. Um, I haven't touched it since. Um, I switched to an e-cigarette around the same time, and I've been lowering the nicotine levels in that ever since, and it's taken me that long to quit at the start of this year in January, and I haven't touched it since. Um, Outside of the physical addiction, is it more of the ritual slash routine of smoking? What's the hardest thing to stop? It was feeling like I needed a crutch. I needed something because this world is so hard. It's letting go of that idea that um, I don't need a crutch. It was hard. It's it's who am I? Who am I without the cigarette? It's that kind of thought as well. Yeah, a lot of people's identities get built around addictions. Who am I if I'm not the stoner guy? You know, yeah. um, who am I if I'm not the fun guy with a drink in his hand all the time? You know, it, that, that's what most addictions I find are based on. It's an, it's a pride situation as well, as well as just um, obviously self-medicating to deal with trauma as well. I think a lot of that was what mine was based upon. Um, fear, you know, fear of not having something to lean on. But I, I put all my faith in God and, and I lent on him and he's done nothing but help me become a better person ever since and, and free of these addictions so you know it's not that's not very convincing to somebody who's not a christian i know it's not convincing evidence that they exist but uh, for me personally i've seen real tangible results by by focusing my attentions onto this true form of spirituality not just these vain philosophies that come out of the new age um i'm yeah. actually seeing results you know and and it's not just that i, I being born again is a serious thing. You, you are, you, your old self literally dies. I, I understand that now. And I wasn't the same person after that moment. And it's kind of like everything I once loved and wanted to do, I hated suddenly. I didn't want to do it anymore. You know, it's like you, I became a person who didn't see the joy or pleasure in those things anymore. Yes. Somehow, you know, suddenly it was disgust rather than joy at the thought of doing them. Um, um, the conviction came on me every time I smoked a cigarette. I was, it was always, why am I doing this? 
you know, you know in the past it was like oh well what's the harm you know whatever you only live once but suddenly it wasn't that anymore nothing was like that i couldn't just do something that would be considered a sin anymore without actually feeling convicted about it and you know like i said i didn't change overnight i don't I think a lot of people think you know being born again or coming to a christian faith means you have to be perfect instantly and it's not that's just that's a very churchianity mainstream way of seeing it it's it's a personal relationship and a journey you know exactly and it's also impossible to be perfect I, how well, can a human being be perfect on this this plane of existence well i you can't that's why you need a savior that's why you need christ to intercede on your behalf for, with god you know because you're not perfect and you never will be and god gets that you know and i, yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, you know zealots out there and people out there who will tell you you know you have to follow the rules perfectly or else and it's kind of yes and no try your best is basically the mantra you know do the hardest you know yes. you, you know when you're falling short you know when you're not being who you should be or when you're you're failing you know it you know and try not to try your hardest and you know when you're not trying your hardest you know you know you know when you're not living up to your full potential and it's kind of yeah. you, you you kind of learn you know as you grow in in your faith and go on your journey with god that he kind of has a life planned out for you which is your life that you would want you know yes and it's he's not forcing you to take it but it's there if you take the leap of faith and just go for it you know and a lot of people are scared and trapped in their own i've got to pay the bills i've got to have this job i can't go and do whatever i want because of this type of thing you know and and it's kind of it's scary to 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 take that leap but I found if you just do, if you if you put in ten percent of the effort, he'll carry you the rest of the way. You know that's it's kind of yeah. what I'm that's kind of what I'm learning as 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 you know my own journey with faith is going. You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of you know I was scared to give up cannabis, but I did. I just did. I just stopped it, and I could I could feel his support throughout the whole thing. You know, um, it, it's. I mean, my life is 10 times better than what it was before, before this, you know, since then, you know, I, I worked at Aldi, I became a manager. I got a lot of money behind me because mm -hmm. it, it pays well, but I also got the experience of, of managing people, which is, Indeed. which will stick with me for the rest of my life. And it prepared me in yeah. a way to be a kind of a leader, you know, in a way, mm -hmm. I'm not saying I, I am a leader or follow me or anything, but it gave me that ability to understand, you know, how to talk to people and, and understand that people have different needs and requirements as a and a good leader isn't somebody who bosses somebody around it's somebody who is an example for others to to look up to and want want to follow you know and, and help yes. this type of thing and you, understanding needs understanding the, yeah, yeah. Some, you know, the right places but and stuff yeah i feel like god put me there to learn that because um at the time i had the channel for a little while and um, I started in 2014, but in 2017, I had to stop because work found the channel. And I had just been promoted by this point. And they kind of said to me, look, you can't have this channel and be a man. the channel? <sighs> because it was no secret when I worked at an old store as a store assistant. It didn't matter then. I was just a lowly store assistant. They didn't care. Um, but when I went to a new store as a manager, um, no one knew me. They didn't know anything about the channel. So I didn't tell them about it. I thought it's probably best they don't know. Um, yeah. But then someone from my old store came to work there for a day and just told everyone. <laughs> and so that was it. The uh, cat was out of the bag. And then I, I came in one day and I just I just knew something was wrong. Um, yeah. And then my manager pulls me in there with my area manager and they're all like, uh, yeah, Paul, you can't have this channel and, and a YouTube and be a manager. You can't do it. Um, you, you talk about too much controversial stuff. This is a multicultural, diverse company, you know, and if they hear the kind of things you're talking about um, and they complain, we're not going to be able to protect you, is what they said. We're not, wow. basically, we're not going to be on your side, you know. So to protect you now, we're, we're advising you get rid of that channel. If not, then we're going to have to demote you. Um, and I was in no position at this point in my life to, to, to argue I needed the money. I was in debt, you know, from university, credit card debt and all that sort of type of thing. I just got this manager position and I knew I needed the experience just to set me up for life, basically. Um, so I capitulated in a moment of weakness that I'm not very proud of. And I did. I stopped the channel. I removed all my videos. I, and, you know, in, re in hindsight, you know, I'd, I was 17 episodes into my clown series by this point. And I had to stop, you know, and I, for five years, I just stayed away from conspiracy. All my videos were private. Everything was gone. And I just 
lived a normal life, I suppose, back in back into it, but as you know, obviously with my own Christian belief and perspective. Indeed. But in that yeah. t- in that time, you know, I, I do feel like actually it was probably good for me because I was becoming a very angry person with the state of the world at the time. This was during a time when uh, minor attracted persons were about trying to. Gosh, you know, yeah, I know exactly the period you're talking yeah. about. Yes, you know, the Salon released an article trying to ver- talk about virtuous children yeah. others you know and i couldn't i just couldn't yeah. deal with it i was getting very angry you know what i mean and i was making pretty loud shouting swearing videos about the situation you know and um maybe that's what contributed to my downfall in the end maybe that's some of the videos they saw i don't know but <laughs> uh, that, that comes with commenting on other particular groups of people a part of maybe like what i like to call the multicolored collective you know who are kind of yes. a, a protected class these days you know and i think that yeah, and I think that's where the whole, Paul, this is a multicultural, diverse company, you know, you can't be talking about this type of stuff. I think that's where all that kind of came from. Um, but yeah, you know, I think maybe looking hindsight, I needed that break just to get some perspective and become grounded again. Yeah. Uh, in the real world, I've been swimming in the occult and conspiracy and Christianity and really out. I've been floating in space for so long. I forgot what it was like to be right here on the ground with real people, you know. Uh-huh. and in, I had to come straight crashing back down and, and, and live that life, you know, and I kind of just shut myself off from it all for a long time and, and just focused on work, bettering myself, you know, uh, going to the gym. Um, you know, I, I, met, I met my beautiful wife and we're now married. Um, I have an amazing son who's about to turn two. Um, Congratulations. You know, and like I said, I've been losing these addictions and everything and, and just <laughs> focusing on getting my own house in order, basically. Um, but then, and then, um, someone picked up my channel, my series called Conspiracy R Us. He picked up my information. He was a regular commenter back in the day, um, and he started basically telling people about my theory, saying, "There's this theory I heard years ago on this channel that isn't around anymore." Talking about my channel, and he repopularized the Nephilim look like clowns concept. And I kind of felt emboldened by this point to re-release all the videos and stop them from being private. Um, yeah. Because obviously, you know, the people wanted to know about it. And I was kind of amazed that while wow, people are actually responding to my theory, you know, yeah. that, you, that you like the work. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll show them my work. You know, here it is. And I gained a big influx of subscribers then, but I wasn't around making videos. I was still hidden, you know, yeah. um, I, I wasn't allowed to make them. And, you know, I watched the resurgence of my channel and I kind of had this calling, this feeling like I, I need to come back. You know, I don't, yeah. this is... I kind of I eventually realized, you know, I'm, I'm sick of pretending to be a manager of a supermarket. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist. That's what I, yeah. you know, that's what I am. I'm an artist. I'm a creative person. I'm a thinker. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I have critical thinker most importantly, sir. Exactly. You know, I, and it's like, I don't belong here managing people stacking shelves. This is not my, this is not my life, you know. Yeah. This is not the life God wants me to have. I know it's not. And things started to happen that were pushing me out of the company. Um, I'd always been going for the next step up to become the store manager. And mm-hmm. they always kept pushing me back or putting me in situations that would make me, you know, it's a competitive cutthroat world. Okay. And there are people, yeah. there are people who are willing to step on you to get on top in that world. And mm-hmm. I end up getting sent to another store to try and train me to be, um you know the next step type of thing and the new manager instantly said i was shit at the job and i'll never be promoted i had and this is some this comes off to, after running one shift um after being off for three weeks with covid and knowing no staff or anything about the store and how it operates she judged my performance off of that and then shot down my chances and i was like okay so i'm in for a bad run working under you then you know i could tell straight away it turns out she was just a raging sexist who only wanted women to be promoted um and literally i was warned from the start by other male managers there saying she does not like men she does not like men like i are you saying like i myself had some serious issues being here with her you're in for it you know um, and I, I was like, nah, I'll be right. I'll get it to like me. You know, I'm, you know, it's like, I'll figure it out, you know. And, and it turns out, no, that's not what happened. I got accused of theft, even though I didn't commit any theft. And I got suspended under her watch. And she handled the whole thing proper creepily and weird. And um, 
this is why my wife was was in a third trimester as well so the stress this put under our family was was just ridiculous you know i was about to lose my job and have a baby and anyway i proved unequivocally outright through the i had the receipts you know and the camera footage that she's full of it and she's lied and that's just not true and the whole the whole thing got dropped okay and she suffered no consequences for it but i never forgot you know and i end up going back to my I ended up going back to my old store because I just couldn't work with this woman anymore. And and it was just one thing after another thing. Like, I was always being, like, led along saying, yeah, you can be a manager. Everyone always kept telling me, Paul, you're one of the best managers we've ever had. Everyone would tell me that, you know. Uh-huh. But they would never promote me. And it's kind of like, why? You know? And then they would then they hired outside people to take the role instead from other companies. And I had to I had to train them. And, train them. And it's, <laughs> and it's one insult after another, you know what I mean? It was just one insult yeah. after another. And then then one night I got um, called to deal with a, uh, a customer at the till who was being, uh, basically being a bitch because she wasn't getting served alcohol because she didn't have ID for her two children who looked mm-hmm. close to 18 but weren't, you know what I mean? And um, I said, look, they've refused the sale. It's their license. It's my license, you know, and it's their right to refuse sales. I'm sticking with my staff on this one. I said, I'm not going to serve you. I'm sorry. Um, you know, go to Tesco around the corner. I don't care. <laughs> and then, then she started screaming in my face. Eventually, I was I was cool and calm for uh, trying to explain the same thing over and over again. And then she screamed and swore right right in my face, you know, and threatened me. And I just said, get out, get just get out now, you know. Not in my store. I don't care. You're banned. You're barred. Do not come back. And um, then she hung around outside. Then she got her daughters to take photos of me through the window while I was serving customers at the till. And then next thing I know, an hour later, I get called down to the till again, uh, saying, Paul, someone here wants to see you. I get to the till, and then someone taps on my shoulder and says, are you Paul? I said, yeah. And then he grabs me around the throat and basically starts pushing me across the store and screaming, if you, you know, if you talk to my fucking wife like that again, I'll kill you all this sort of thing. Um, customers rip him off me, you know, and I, and I had to just, you get out of here right now, you know, and then I just call the police and go through the whole process. Um, and after that day, you know, I was kind of like sick of it. I was like, what the hell am I doing in this, this company yeah. that does not care about me? in the slightest you know what i mean and the police did nothing to help me either the company gave me no compensation um even though i know they give way less for people slipping on grapes you know what i mean and it's kind of like i had nothing from this company but misery misery and pain from the start and it's kind of like i felt like now i look back in hindsight god was pushing me to get get out is what he was trying to say and proving to me over and over again Last year, you almost got sacked for something you didn't do. Now you're being strangled. You do not belong here. Leave. You know? And me, me and my wife just, just basically said to each other, what are we? She worked for Aldi as well at the time. And she was also going through her own nightmare, absolute nightmare through some apprenticeship scheme that came to nothing, you know? And uh, it was, we just looked at each other and we're like, we're both creative people. Why don't, yeah. why don't we just start our own business? Let's just go for it. We're never going to do it otherwise. And we did. We just did. We just quit our jobs. And we started our own photography company, a wedding photography company, family photography. And it's been growing steadily. You know, we, we, we've, we've done like five weddings in the year and other things in between family shoots, pet photography, headshots and, and commercial mm-hmm. photography. And, you know, it's it's early days. It's only six months old, but five weddings already. Yeah. You know what I mean? We're doing all right. It's growing steadily. Yeah. And, and we're just trying to build that profile and it gave me the freedom as well to come back to YouTube. And, you know, in terms of and to be yourself and, and to, to be your, your authentic self or absolutely. And, you know, I started up with the clown stuff again and people love it, you know, and, and I love researching it and writing the book on the thing now, you know, and I have a huge level of support and interest in the book already. And, I feel like I'm finally me. I'm free. I'm I'm doing what I need, what I was intended to do and be in the yeah. world, you know, and I'm utilizing my own creativity, which I have a degree in. I may as well have used it eventually, you know, but it's, it's hard. It's a process and it's a struggle because, yeah. you know, <laughs> I need money to live at the end of the day. You know, I left a very well-paying job um, to, to start from the beginning and be my own boss. And like I said, it's, it's growing steadily. And I've been blessed this past week, you know, and month that the channel's just grown so much that, 
I've practically, I've doubled the earnings I was on up until this point, um, just with the extra viewership. I mean, it's nowhere near what I used to earn, but it's showing me it's going in the right direction that I, that I might be able to keep doing this uh, as a job. Not, 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 not my you know. not my words have so much power, Paul, as yeah. you know. But you will, you will have enough money to be able to continue <laughs> to grow and to thrive. You will look back. Remember these dates. Remember oh, the year. Yeah. You will look back in four years' time and say, "Remember, I was talking to Noble about you know, it was only six months into this business, and look where we are now. Yeah. You know, look where the oh. channel is. I've got, I've got the books out. I'm on my second book. I've got like the third book in mind. You're gonna look back and think, yeah." The most high only gives you as much as you can deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is what I mean. It's 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 all pointing in the right direction. It's working, and I, I all I had like I have to put the effort in, and he he gives it back. You know, is what I'm finding, and I took the leap of faith, and it's paying off. It's paying dividends. You know, and I, again, I have a long way to go. I'm still on a technically I'm on universal credit to back up any earnings I have that, from the loss. Yeah. But, but come March, that goes. I get nothing from the government anymore and it's I'm on my own in terms of earning. So my target is by March to have the book almost ready to be released, you know, and to have my YouTube earnings at a decent enough level that I can at least pay the rent. Um, I might actually hit 600 this month um, with YouTube revenue and patron. So that's rent. That's that, not food. That's just rent covered for one month. Yes. You know? yes. Um, so, but the, with the trajectory, if by March, hopefully I can have something more reasonable on top of the money I earn from my photography business, which is yes. going to take a while to grow, you know? So that that's, that's my life up until now, you know, and that's who I am and that's where I'm at. And that's the wave I'm riding currently, you know? Yes, wife riding that wave very well, sir. It's been it's it's most definitely been a um an interesting journey. As I say, it mirrors so much I guess of so many creators. I'm I I uh, not so much these days, I don't have as much time, but I, as a youngster I used to be a, a painter and a drawer myself. Um it's very much a creative as well career wise i've been through that whole corporate system and had that yo you know you would be a perfect managing director we're gonna fast track you <laughs> uh bloody you know and then as you say you get these outside people coming in and you're training them to be and you're like well, what's going on here i might just be used for for you know to enrich somebody else and then you say to yourself actually you know what let's take the big dive Let's jump out, you know, into this big, wide business world. And let's actually do it for myself rather than earning millions of pounds for these other people and I'm being mistreated. Let's just do it. Let's put in the hard work now and let, let, let's let reap the rewards, you know, later. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I, I, again, like I said earlier, I, I cannot pretend to be something I'm not anymore. That that did more spiritual damage to me than the drugs, I think, in the long run, you know. Um, like I said, you know at your core when you're not living up to, to, to God's plan for you, you know. You you just know it, and it's it's hard. You know, I, I could have said something more secular, like living up to your full potential, but that's what it really is, you know. It's, you know that God made you as this individual with all these minuses and pluses to your personality you know and you got to play to your strengths and if you do play to your strengths you'll have life more abundantly and you will you will succeed in those things and you know when you're just not doing that you know and I, I felt like for five years in a way I was being trained and I learned a lot don't get me wrong but it got to a point where I was holding on and it was time to move on and things were happening which were telling me move on move on move on from him himself from God himself I would say now you know and um when i finally listened i could see that there was a net in place you know he, he had a plan he had a path for me to follow and the arrows were pointing that way go that way you know and i've just been listening to those subtle hints and and again it, things have just got so much better um but yeah. you to that that, fir that first thought that you have i mentioned this a few times on the, on the broadcast you have an initial thought. Here's, here's a scenario to paint the vivid picture. You're in your vehicle and you're driving. 
and you get that inclination, you see a bit of traffic up ahead and you think, shall I turn off and do the shortcut? No, I'll stay in it. It doesn't look too bad. Yeah. And you get minutes. That first thought, that first idea to do something, go with it. Absolutely. With that, that instinctual thought, which is guided by the most high. Absolutely. Follow, follow your gut. I mean, my, this is the thing, right? I always, uh, my wife always says we need to do something. And I, I always second guess it because it's like, nah, nah. I mean, she's following her gut on a situation. I'm not. I mean, I'm always overcritical about something. And it always turns out her gut feeling was 100% correct. We should have done what she said. You know, so I'm kind of learning over the years. That I'm just going to listen to my wife on this one. I think, you know, she, she's better at following her instincts than I am. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. What can I say? But uh, <laughs> like I said, it was thanks to her that I had the courage to actually quit and do what we wanted to do. You know, I, I don't think I could have done it without her. Um, and I certainly couldn't have started the website or anything or the business, you know, the technological side of it and the networking side without her help as well. And it's, it, we're a team, you know, uh, yes. at the end of the day. Yes. Thanks to Mrs. Thanks to the Mrs. <laughs> oh, sorry. In the, um, the batteries, quote unquote, in your back and giving you that, 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 that inertia to say, no, well, let's do it. Let's, you know, there's no time like the present for let's well, bloody do it. I think my listeners need to also understand, you know, I mean, there wouldn't even be a channel right now that they're on enjoying and watching my videos without her as well. So it all really is, you know, she's one of the major players in that game. So, yeah. 100%. Have you gone down any specific uh, denomination, reference Christianity, or are you just literally in, in the word and studying the book, etc.? I, I, I suppose I'm non-denominational, um, traditionally, is what that would be called, but I'm also a bit of a, a, um, a contrarian, in a way. My, my, my worldview on Christian history isn't the mainstream by biblical, um, sorry, Sunday school churchianity type of view of things. You know, I'm not a Sethite believer that, you know, all the evil came, um, you know, the, that the, the giants that were created, the Nephilim were created by just men having sex, you know, evil men having sex with evil women. <laughs> you know, I believe that fallen angels came down and mated with women to create giants um, but that's just not the the mainstream church understanding of what happened, what went down there in Genesis six. So that alone makes me a contrarian straight away from the very beginning of the Bible. Um, and I have a lot. Of, I came at it all from the back door, I suppose. You know, I'm a backdoor Christian in that respect. That um, I didn't go grow up in a church. I didn't. I don't speak Christianese. You know, I don't sound like a Christian. <laughs> that's that's the thing. I don't know how to be like that or act like that in a way. I just. I just. I read the word, you know, I follow Jesus as my example and I do my research and I let God lead my research through, through the words. And I, I gleam knowledge and information from it. And I share my thoughts on my channel and my research on my channel. Um, and that's kind of how I do it. You know, I don't, I don't go to a church. Um, I did try in the beginning, but I just didn't. I did that. Explain that experience, your first experience with this new, as, as a new man entering <laughs> the quote unquote house of God. What was that experience like? Well, if you want to go with my first true experience, we're going way back. We're going back to when I was a young, young child, maybe six or seven. And my grandma's a devout Catholic. Um, so I went to a mass with her one morning and a, a, a woman died in front of me. Um, oh, she she passed out basically and just fell to the side and she was on the end of the um the pews and the, yeah. and they have wooden arms at the end you know solid hardwood and yeah she, she hit her head on that as she went down um oh. and she died you know she bled out then and there so i witnessed that that was right in front of me you know um and it never left me. And maybe that's why I had a lot of anti-Christian beliefs growing up, maybe into my teenage years. Maybe it was that experience, you know. But, um, you know, as a, in hindsight now, I don't look at that back on That's just an unfortunate circumstance. You know, I don't think yeah. there's anything mystical or magical now thinking mm -hmm. about it. The woman, was like, the woman was like 95, you know what I mean? It's kind of, she was never going to survive that fall, no matter how it were she landed. It's that type of thing. But, uh, but my my own attempt to consciously go into a church because I want to be there, you know, yeah. was, um, again, during this period of time before I met my wife, you know, so maybe like 2016, 2017 period where I was trying to, I was coming off cannabis, you know, I was looking for more community 
Um, I didn't have the YouTube community I have now, which I would call my church in a way. It's um, a gathering of like-minded Christians sharing ideas as a church, as far as I'm concerned. And that's what I have now, luckily. Um, I wouldn't say I'm not a church leader. I'm not a pastor. or you know, I don't don't misquote me on that. I um, I just happen to have created a lovely community where even I, I, I'm a part of it. You know, I'm not a leader of it. Um, and I get to, you know, commune with people there. And that's my church in a way where, you know, we're one of more gather is where church is my name that's his church exactly you know so um but i did go to a few local ones in my area and I, I got to know um the leader of one of them and it wasn't in a church church he was in a community center but um okay. and they were just the lovely people don't get me wrong okay the nice yeah. people they mean well they just don't know the stuff that oh, I, I was into yeah. you know they don't think about it like that and it's very much all about the community and and it's i felt like they were just there to to socialize with each other rather than actually consider the the world as it is and and yes. get deep about that kind of thing it was more just yeah. a, a community meeting rather than a church meeting in a way um and i think that's probably money's behind that you know at the end of the day they have to reach certain standards and keep above keep it above the line in certain ways to maintain that funding you know i think there's a lot of that behind it because i did bring up some of these subjects with people and the pastor and he was like hmm that's you know i'm not so sure about that type of thing you know i don't think i want to talk about that or bring that up and um i just I, nice people but just i don't think they were my people not where i not where i belonged necessarily you know um I needed more from my church than what they could offer. Um, yeah. And as, again, that's not any shade on them in a way. It's just, that's how it was for me personally. I can't, I can't, I can't deny that, you know? Um, but like, I, I, it yeah. makes perfect sense for, because you view before you had attempted, attended even, you've had done a lot of research and study in the Gnostic side, which will, as you say, dips in and out of Christianity and the extra biblical texts. So you're coming with a, a foundation of stuff that the average Christian, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, they have no clue. They have no basis or foundation on that. To them, it's all about the Trinity or it's all about, you know, Jesus being, you know, the one and only, um, there's no place for this extra biblical kind of conversations to bring the whole context of what the Bible is. Because remember, as you say, it's been canonized. What, what does that mean? That means they picked and choose the certain selection of books that they wanted to put forth to fit the dominance um, part of Christianity, which is the Roman Catholicism adopt these pagan festivals readjust them and do all these kind of things which gives so much credence to the new age movement to say oh well look they're borrowing all of these pagan festivals and they're they're worshiping mithra and you yeah. know the, the sun god they're worshiping on sunday and there is truth to some of the things they're saying but again without the full the full volume of the book of the words we don't have a full clear clear enough roadmap to really get to the nuts and bolts of what does what does his book, Holy Bible, he only left you basic instructions before leaving Earth. Yeah. Why are we having some man teach his doctrine? Why don't we just read the word? Well, that was that was the whole uh, Protestant movement and the the letter on the door. You know, that's, <laughs> there was a lot about that, you know, and and I, I'm not here again to like throw aspersions towards uh, denominations, particularly. You know, it's not a battle I want to get involved with, but uh, I'm not a Catholic, you know, um, and I am open to extra biblical texts, yes, but I take them all within context of the canon. Um, I do understand yeah. there is some credence to why the text was canonized, you know. Um, I think there has been attempts. I believe throughout history to make minor changes here and there in translation, which is lost through English from the original term, you know, Mesoretic texts. And, and, but I think the Dead Sea Scrolls has proven unequivocally that the text has not changed in thousands of years. Um, and it's the most heavily scrutinized text in the world to change. It would be highly noticed very quickly um, in any form of translation. So it's, it, it's, you know, the story is vast and complex and it's not written in a linear way as much as people think it is, you know, um, yeah. and it has to be, it has to be seen as a whole to understand the whole picture. 
and you can't just yeah. look at one particular event that's talked about in the bible and then and then create a portrait of god from that or a caricature of god from that should i say not even a real portrait um it's it's predominantly the story of the israelites as well yes it's it's a story about a particular type of people and within context to other stories all around the world of other cultures who existed around the same times you'll find there are plenty of other stories that talk about the world as it was then but maybe yes. not from a a a christian well no a, a judaic one god perspective you know there was a lot of pantheonistic religions around at the same time that talk about the same world of pre-diluvian times right well uh, antediluvian and post-diluvian you know there was a lot of um there was a lot of uh, false idol idol worship idolic worship and worship of the sun the pantheon of gods you know and yeah. there was there was nature worship pagan cults yes. all over the place it's always just been kind of the, the case you know and the, the bible is the story of one particular people in a particular geographical location that can't be denied you know um yeah. but that's why you know my work um draws on all cultures all over the earth and i, I look at folk traditions um and I draw parallels from their descriptions of their ancestor spirits, as they call them. Yeah. Um, and I believe the ancestor spirits they're referring to, and they openly admit this, is not grandma and granddad, you know, or the, or the great aunties and uncles. They're talking about the creators of their civilization, their ancient yes. gods, and those were the kings and rulers of an ancient time. And these are specifically the Nephilim, who are now in spirit form. And that's why they have their rituals. It's to evoke those particular spirits. Yes. And uh, yes. what they do is they dress like them. And I found that the common thread through all these ancestor worship religions on every continent is that they all seem to exhibit one or two or maybe three or four features that we would associate with a modern Western clown. Polka dots, um, wild, crazy red hair. Um, uh, stilts is actually quite common as well, believe it or not. And... Um, white face white skin red wide lips large glowing eyes things like that you know and you find uh, what i seem to have stumbled upon is and this is by design is a freemason called charles dibden in the 1800s essentially amalgamated all these features together that he'd probably gleaned from all these cultures which he'd met while traveling and he created his own version of the ancestor spirit and he made it it made it occulted so we don't know that's what it is. And he called it a clown. Um, and that's basically where we get clowns from. They're just a amalgamation of ancestor spirit worship cultures and their dress. And now we dress this way and we don't realize that we're dressing like um, like the Nephilim, basically. And we're, yeah, and we're also evoking them, but in ignorance in the West. Because this is the difference between the West and the rest of the world. You know, they know what they're doing all over the earth. They they commune with demons oh, yeah. and, and they're happy with it, you know, because yeah. we're such a heavily Christianized sect of the earth um, and have a deep history of Christian thought. Um, we're more aware of demons and the negative connotations of them and their effect and their agendas. So they have to kind of remain a bit more hidden in the West. So what they've done is they've hidden behind the image of a clown that we now associate with things like for the children, laughter, yeah. goofiness, funniness, harmless, Funny. silly. Yeah. But what it really is, is a, a carbon copy of, of the ancestor spirit ritual clothing that is worn by everyone else who's purposefully trying to be possessed by Nephilim spirits. Um, and that's the danger that, you know, you have to be careful about what you choose to watch, listen to and wear. It, it's this world is a spiritual world. And basically, symbols open up portals, and the cl yes. the clown is a symbol. That's what it is fundamentally. It's a symbol for the Nephilim. Um, symbols and sigils. So Stephen King clearly drew upon this with his classic of It, which they did that new sort of remake or It Two, whatever it was. Oh yeah, it, it, it basically is what I just said in in a book and in a film. Yeah, that's basically what It is um this is the thing right i don't believe these authors that i know donda's the most amazing authors of our generation and so talented and creative and amazing and wonderful they're not they just know things and they just put it into a book you know and then we the ignorant masses think they're creative geniuses but they're actually yeah. just retelling ancient stories that i've been told over and over again you know um there's nothing special about them and it it is basically um a interdimensional killer demon 
that has a spider form that manifests into the physical world in the form of whatever people fear the most and a clown is the most predominant one it chooses to, to manifest as um and i that's the fictional story that i believe the specific focus on the clown in that book was a hint that yes the nephilim the demons in the in the spirit realm do look like that in a way um, mm. not just like a clown you know i think a clown is a really cartoonish creation stereotyped caricature um mm. what they really looked like was actually a lot more terrifying to be honest yeah. um yeah you know really pale porcelain white skin huge sharp angular grins teeth. with teeth and they had serpent-like mouths that opened really wide you know a snake mm. can dislocate its jaw to eat its prey people don't realize yeah. that but they have a huge maw you know they would have had huge eyes that glowed um they would have had huge long foreheads and skulls they would have had wild red hair coming out of the sides of them you know they would have had um blood around the mouth from the cannibalism and big long thin red human lips on this weird reptilian mouth you know they would have had multicolored fractal pattern of reptilian skin they would have had, they would have had feather motifs all over them as well from like the feathered serpents like quetzalcoatl was one of their parents you know um they would have had uh just it would have been giants it would have been enormous it would have had long thin weird creepy features as well because snakes are long elongated creatures you know yes um everything about them would have been absolutely mortifying for a human being to witness you would have you wouldn't have you would have just stopped dead with fear if you actually witnessed one of these things for what they were um and that's why god sends a flood and that's why it was necessary to wipe out all the giants that were in canaan you know these genocides that people won't wonder about um human humanity was contending with something that was a predator in its truth yeah. in its truest form you know it was killing mm. us he was eating us it was, it was people were sacrificing their children to it people were offering it up you know as sacrifices as food you know people the blood was being drunk regularly you know yeah. there were there were cults dedicated to worshiping them and subjugating societies to continue to worship them too it was yeah. it was a horrible time to be alive and a truly corrupt time for humanity and it got to the point where all flesh was corrupted as it says in the bible yeah. and mm -hmm. even even humanity themselves change their own dna to be like them yeah. and mix themselves with other animals yeah. to, to be like nephilim you know the gods that they idolized um and noah was the only one left so that's basically what happened and then people argue well there are other flood myths all over the earth so you know Noah's just a copy of that myth it's like no they're just stories of nephilim surviving the flood that's all they are happening at the same time as noah um, so do you draw parallels to you draw the their reception from the genesis one creation uh in what do you mean a, a pre-edemic race are you talking about that or? yeah um yeah, i do believe there was a pre-edemic race the people of day six is what gary wayne refers to them as um, the black heads is another example from the zep tepi um but i i would i would say they were basically created and it's described in the Bible as God created man and woman, plural, together at once, man and woman. And then he, he created them. He just says he created man and woman. So that's, that's creating two things at once, plural, multiple beings, you know. Yeah. Um, and he said, go forth and multiply and spread over, dominate the earth and have dominion over it and be caretakers, basically. And I do think yes. that was the first creation of, of humanity. And they did spread the earth, you know, man and woman together. Then it seems like immediately after that, it says God then created Adam from the dust of the earth and breath, did the breath of life into him, you know, and made him a living soul. I think Adam was a second creation specifically created because then it says he put him in the garden alone without a woman, Separate. you know, yeah. um, it's a different, two different stories there, you know, and I'm sure maybe possibly lost throughout history. I bet there's a book out there explaining what happened in that gap somewhere. That isn't canon you know i bet there is yeah you know, but is, is your i is your hypothesis or understanding that the angels created the first creation and then the most high created the second creation is in adam and put him in eden no um it's all god i think there are corruptions out there that would like you to believe angels are involved with the creation of making life but they were the angels were watchers the, their job was to watch god's creation these people of day six that's all their job was just to watch them just to make sure they're okay you know um 
And they ruled as gods over these people, essentially. They were the first real pantheons, you know. There's a, there's a story, a very old story from the, the Pop of Vu, which is a, an, an American Great Plains kind of um, text. And it talks about a, a giant serpent feathered monster that had a golden throne that lived among the people and taught them how to make fire. And basically was kind of basically among them as a god, you know, and, and he was full of pride and ordained in jewels. It was incredibly beautiful, basically how Lucifer was described in the Bible. And he even yeah. says that this person became so prideful that he tried to destroy the creator, the big God, and that he was cast down from the world, the big tree down to earth, something like that. And it's basically telling the story of Lucifer, who was one of these watchers who was supposed to be watching over people and decided, I am not going to bow down to humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. basically where the first rebellion comes from. When God created Adam and put him in the Garden of Eden, and these angels watched Adam naming all the animals. The angels were like, God didn't give us It's like God didn't give us that privilege of naming it. Why is he letting this monkey do it? You know what I mean? Like it's kind of not what we are the serpentine angel race. Surely we should be given dominion over everything, right? You know, and that's basically that prideful jealousy is the first rebellion that caused the fall, you know. And from then on, it seems like there was a period of time where they went quiet. These rebellious angels who were cast down, you know, and they're probably still in the earth, but they were just kind of watched. And then it seems like it says in it says, you know, they sent a serpent into the garden to deceive Eve. Basically, it says you know the serpent was more cunning than any other animal. Basically, I th yeah. we don't know. <laughs> People say, well, that was Satan. I don't think that's what was going on. I don't know. I wasn't there, okay? But uh, it's been theorized that um, perhaps the serpent was a race of beings that lived at the time, which were like upright walking lizard people, like human in, in form, you know? And it seems like the whole birds of a feather flock together type of situation and the, the lizard men sided with the rebellious lizard angels. You know, the seraphim angels, basically. Yes. And it's kind of like, you know, you're our kind, we're on your side. We think we should have been made the leaders of the earth, not this, not the the man, you know, it should have been the mm -hmm. lizard, basically. Um, and I think it was one of them who was allowed to walk freely in the Garden of Eden, you know, they were allowed to be there, convinced Eve to do something she shouldn't have done, you know, yeah. to rebel, basically. Um. And that's what got them cast out. There's loads of stuff in between. People argue about whether, you know, she had sex with a with a lizard person and created Cain and all these. But I don't know if any of that's true. It's all speculation. Humanity between thy seed and the woman's seed. Yes, yeah, all that stuff. All that stuff, yeah. yeah. And now, again, I, although that's possible, I think the story can still go on without that being the case. Okay. The whole corruption issue is still there regardless it's it's a, it's an inner it's an inner thing not necessarily a dna thing okay um it, yeah, yeah, yeah it's not necessarily a serpent seed thing although i do i am empathetic to the theory and i'm not denying the theory i do think the the rebellion nate the rebellious nature in our hearts is what you can also glean from the story if you don't want to go down that route um of, yeah. of literal seed corruption you know um you know cain rebelled against god by killing his brother because his sacrifice was wasn't considered as good as his brothers it was jealousy it was pride just yeah. the same reason lucifer um rebelled against god he didn't want to bow down to a human it was jealousy and pride you know and again this whole birds of a feather flock together people of a kind you know kind of work together type of thing i think once the casting out of eden was done and once witnessing cain murder his brother i do think the angels who had rebelled and were cast into the earth, watched this happen and basically made a deal with Cain and said, you know, you don't like God. We don't like God. Let's work together, basically. And it seems like a pact was made where the daughters of Cain would have sex with the Watchers who were convinced by Lucifer to have sex with women, basically. It seemed like the Watchers he convinced weren't necessarily a part of the rebellion initially. You know, they were just actually workers on the earth who watched humans, you know. And it seems like he got Remember, me. Remember, Azazel and them taught women how to beautify, etc. Absolutely, yeah. They taught all sorts. They taught them everything, you know. And it was while this whole sex thing was going on, it seems like they were teaching them stuff, you know. 
And it, it did nothing but corrupt humanity. He created the Nephilim, who at first were seen as gods, as brilliant things, as amazing wonders, yeah. but then very quickly became cannibalistic monsters that humans couldn't support anymore. And then within, you know, this happened in the sixth generation from Seth. Yeah. So, sorry, yes, from, from Seth. These are the days of Jared. This is when the incursion happened. So, you know, humans have been around for a while. The lineage of Seth, the lineage of Cain, mixing with the people of day six, have kind of always been around, you know. Cities, cities were being built. You know, Cain himself was no angel. Like, he was a brutal dictator, you know. He was subjugating these people of day six to build cities for him. Yeah. He, he was a man who walked with Adam, who walked with God. He knew stuff. Yeah. You know, yes. he knew things. He introduced, like, weights and measures and, and all sorts of things to the people, money and all that kind of thing, you know. And once you add weights and measures into somebody's vocabulary, you start dividing property and lines up and you create yeah. you create factions, you create war, you know. And, and he, he basically said, you know, as soon as he left, he got a wife from somewhere and built... A son. The land of none. <laughs> yeah, and where, built a city, where, yeah. Where would you say that geographically today the land of Nod could be if it was east of Eden? I couldn't I couldn't say. I wouldn't I would not like to hazard a guess. I really would not. Um it, it, I've heard speculation perhaps it was Russia. But I mean, who the hell knows? Like honestly, truly. But I've yeah. I've heard so many argu arguments over where Eden was, you know, and it, we don't know where we're starting from to get east of Eden, you know? So I, I don't, again, I don't think... What's the starting point? Well, <laughs> I'm going to hear Russia, Russia, the new one. I'll have to look at that, that element of it. But, well, Eden itself had, correct me, listeners, commenters, yeah. had well, to have been on the continent of Africa, which encompasses what we call Israel. It's on the tectonic plates, further over to Saudi Arabia or the quote-unquote Middle East, which is oxymoron, if we even call it the Middle East, but we use it for, for layman's terms and for talking purposes. Yeah. But that whole, in the Bible, that's where we're talking about, that that place. Of, it it of, just seemed like a special place to God because he it was that yeah. land that was promised to the Israelites, um, in, you know, the land of Canaan, as it was called, Canaan. as it was filled, yes. as it was filled with all these giants who seemed to know to go to that one spot after the yeah. flood and that's where they all congregated so there's a lot of evidence pointing that direction but we don't know how we don't know how far he traveled east to get to the land of nod you sure what i mean we don't yeah. we don't know these things i i think it's again even though it's interesting to speculate i think it, you can get bogged down in the weeds trying to get you know yeah the, my new show. the our overarching stories the bigger picture is kind of what i've always been interested in um and i like the minutiae i do like those little details and speculation but uh, i would never you know bet money on any of these answers because no no, no you couldn't you, you couldn't, really you know couldn't. no exactly but i i, I mean we're talking about you know, like i said the, the rebellion and cain cain was no angel you know and it, it does seem like i've read in the book of lamech of cain um, it's a book that got released recently by the Vatican, supposedly, um, and it's an old antediluvian story. And it talks about um, Cain's lineage, and um, by the sixth generation from Cain was Lamech, and there was two Lamechs. There was a Lamech on Seth's side, and there was a Lamech yes. on Cain's side. Okay, so this is the evil Lamech on Cain's side, and you know he's his story is really weird. It, it gives some insight into just how evil and corrupt the antediluvian age was. He's basically trying to ask his father, like, who did Cain mate with to create all these people? It doesn't make it's like it's like it doesn't make any sense, you know, and his father doesn't really have an adequate answer for him. And he's kind of like he wants an answer to this question. So it seems like even then people were ignorant about their history. The corruption was kind of happening already, you know what I mean? Yeah. They didn't know about the people of day six type of thing. It was just a, it was a bit of a confusion matter then, you know. And Cain basically says, and why do all the children of Cain have leprous white skin? Why are we cursed with this chalky porcelain white weird dead person's skin? You know, you know the mark of Cain and the people who yeah. were born from it. And that that theory alone was for my for my own clown theory was perfect because it makes sense. You know, if if serpentine like fiery angels are mixing with porcelain white skinned children of Cain, mm -hmm. then you get a white skinned redhead monster we call a clown. You know, <laughs> that's basically the result, isn't it? So that kind yeah. of it fit to my theory quite prominently, which is why I'm inclined to believe that may have been what the mark of Cain was. But I don't know. 
you know, um, and again, you have to be careful with these extra biblical texts because you, you just don't know who the source is to really know. Okay, let's look. Let's again look at the the landmass. And as you as you pointed out, if he's saying just like um, Noah, Noah was an albino, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it said Noah was born, and he he has the visage of the sons of the angels, is what it says. Yes, like he, exactly, he looks like so, a Nephilim, you know. And people, it, he was dad was freaked out and was like going to his dad, like Dad, I'm freaking out. I, I think I've given birth to a Nephilim, like you know. And it it wasn't. It's just because he had divine nature to him, which was inherited from God, because he was going to be the the progenitor of all of mankind, you know. Indeed, and yeah. you can't you can't not have a divine nature to you without this this white skin, pale, glowing eye, brilliant, bright hair thing going on. He had white curly hair, apparently. Um, and obviously, Nephilim being half angel naturally had that glow about them, you know. And it's kind of he, but Noah being a part of God. God's you no know, don't forget it says you know God creates people he knew you before you were even in the womb you know so yeah. Noah was Noah was created for a, per, a divine purpose essentially so no wonder he had such yeah. crazy divine features but yeah you know for, I actually wrote in my book about Noah because you can glean from his description what people thought Nephilim looked like during that time do you get what I mean because yeah. because yeah. his own dad says to him as well says to his dad I think my wife has given birth to a Nephilim creature. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And if that, if he's thinking that, then that means whatever Noah looks like, we can say the Nephilim must have had similar features. So I've kind of yeah. used that in my book, you know, as an, as an inference. Yes. Like, yeah. 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 And, and also, he also begs, uh, well, he raises the question, well, what, what were, what did the rest of the people look like? Because we look at, let's, go back to like Christian them and, and etc and the leaflets them and the, the the images of Yeshua Hamashiach Jesus are on and all of the the saints and stuff they look like you Paul <laughs> white and and yeah yeah but geographically right though we wouldn't have had that we would have had a, a homogenous society of sorts but predominantly people would have generally brown skin right? I don't know what the world was even like then. Maybe there wasn't even like sunshine as we know it then. Maybe melanin was a completely different thing and how it interacted. This, this, this is thousands of years ago. I think people were a lot bigger then as well. You know what I mean? I think it was a different time. You know, it's described as like the golden age in other terminology and outside sources. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was a time when there was no darkness you know there was no yeah. there was no moon and all this type of thing it was a, a perpetual light you know what i mean and 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 everything was uh lighter then and gravity was even different and uh, this, all this type of thing you know and we live longer as well yeah we we're, dying like 900 years yeah so i think race it's... wasn't really a thing i don't think it was a, a thing then maybe post diluvian maybe race became a thing because it's it, i think people get confused you know i think the earth the world and the spiritual realm are one thing i think we are spiritual creatures even our reality is a spirit realm of some kind and i think there's a nature to it we don't quite understand and it says after the flood you know god put a rainbow in the sky as a sign that he would never I... he would never flood the earth ever again and i've yeah. kind of through my own psychedelic perspective this is so say paul not so say if the lord you know but uh it, it perhaps perhaps it's trying to say your perception of reality is now limited to the, the color spectrum. Um, I have limited your perceptions of the spirit realm to this very minute band of, of light frequency, you know. And I think that was done to protect us from the spirits of the Nephilim, which now reside in the spirit realm in disembodied form after being wiped out by wars and the flood. And it was our way of no longer having to communicate with them. But I think that might have also changed the way we perceive each other in terms of colour as well. I think it changed everything about humanity down. And I think that's perhaps where the term a hue man comes from. You know, a man of a man of hue, a man of colour. Um and not, that's mankind. Exactly, yeah. I think something changed after the flood dramatically, you know, and I think the world became a much harder physical place as a result of it. And, and our flesh became a lot more of an issue. Um, which is why the yeah. the man for a, a savior came, you know. And again, I don't judge a man, you know, by the color of his skin. It's by character, and that's kind of how it probably always was before something got something happened to us, you know. Before these um, 
space monkeys, as I like to call them, or these wicked beings who've come into power and have put all these crazy things into place, geo, social, political terms, i.e. black and white. I am not black. You're not white. We don't have a color spectrum like that. We are people. <laughs> and we have a, uh, I guess we have nationalities, you know, i.e. where we come from on this plane of existence. Yeah. This idea of race and ethnicity, it's we, we, we can clearly see that there are differences in this in this plane of existence in regards to people. We've got humans, we've got mankind. This is this is this is noble talking now. <laughs> we've got full magnum man walking around here. We've got the, the the sons of a knack walking around here. We've got all types of different beings. We've got hybrids walking around. We see I see people who are you know who look normal, and I see people think. Ooh, God, they're clearly mixed with something. They, they've got a little bit of a different aura to them as well. Yeah. We've got a, a whole, you know, explosion of different things that are going on. But because in the most people's sense, that's myth and fairy tales. There's no such thing as as, as dwarfs and fairies. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as dragons. Even though if we go to a museum, they now call them dinosaurs. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's like <laughs> yeah tricky it's tricky this is the problem i i I agree with what you said that there are obvious differences okay but i think in terms of salvation that's why that's why christ came is to put an end to this issue of difference everyone can be born again in christ now do you know what i mean and it's some people will never take that offer and maybe they're the ones that are too far gone but it's not like there was never open to them you know what i mean um and maybe there are people who identify with a specific class and or race and i'm not just talking about skin color it could be a different type of race you know you know what i mean like it is it maybe but maybe some people do identify with it so hardcore that it, it defines them in a way which might not be good for the rest of humanity and then they create their own sex and cults dedicated to that type of thing sure but I think in terms of the corruption of humanity, I, I think it was it was the whole point of needing a saviour. I think um, we're kind of... Everyone is a little bit messed up. Everyone has a bit of that corruption in them, that genetic corruption as well as, you know, spiritual corruption. Um, and again, this is... It's complicated to talk about because there are so many people who disagree with these ideas and, uh, and things. Yeah. And I don't want to dwell on it myself because I, I I get people who try and argue with me, for example, that, well, you're you're encouraging killing people because they might have lizard blood in them. <laughs> you know what I mean? No. It's kind of like, no, that's not where I'm going with this. But I can see how some people may come to that incredibly dangerous conclusion with this type of research. Do you get what I mean? And like extreme, because as, as there are extremes, as as they say, yeah. there's Christian extremists, there's Muslim extremists, there's scientism extremism, there's extremism in every facet and idea and concept that man has. Absolutely, you know, and it worries me that type of thing because that's not what I'm propagating. You know what I mean? And when I say, you know, God tried to God wiped out the giants in Canaan using Israel, Israel, people are saying, well, you're saying then that God killed people. You know, God was killing people and. And God doesn't do that type of thing. You know, he was justified. Just because they're a different race, it's okay to kill them type of thing. That's evil, you know. And it's like, no, I don't think you understand what the, these things actually were. <laughs> you know, when yeah. they, weren't, yeah. they weren't anywhere close to people, you know. Not like today with these corruptions. They're, they're pretty much human, yeah. you know what I mean? They're just as close. They're trying. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, But then they weren't even close. The differences were apparent. Like in not, in not only in looks, but in stature, you know, and yes. in in the way they acted too, it was pure, continuous, vicious, anti-human evil, you know, anti God's creation evil, and they they were monsters by the true definition of it, you know, yeah. and it's different today, you know, we don't live in that weird antediluvian no. time, you know. Now now we kind of do have to just deal with in, in the physical realm with people mainly, mainly. Perhaps there are cryptids here and there and creatures of the night, you know, that that are spooky and creepy and perhaps remnants of these twisted creatures from the past, you know. These humans who mix themselves with animals. Perhaps there are a few mermaids knocking about here and there, a few vampires knocking about, you know, but and like giant hairy men here and there. They're always reported yeah. in the scene, you know, but it's, it's not, yeah it's not what it was you know what i mean it's not it's it's 
we were saved from how brutal it truly was. Mankind is the main evil on this world now, if there's anything, you know. And mm. th this is like it's the end days now. It's the separation of the wheat from the chaff sort of situation. Yes. There, there are going to be some people of every faction, both human and of perhaps Cro-Magnon or reptilian blood, who are going to side with both sides. One, Some of them might be saved, some of them might not. It's kind of, um, it's messed up now. It's really messed up, yep. you know. Um, but that's, uh, you know, I believe in God's mercy. Let's put it that way. Yes, totally. The blueprint's been put, it, it has been laid. Yeah. The information is there. Um, you know, people who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear it's it, it's one of those and i think just like with everything we go to primary school junior school secondary school high school college university yts or apprenticeship schemes these are all levels these are all processes some people are still stuck in primary school we just need to try and help them elevate past primary school, secondary school, and get into the point where they're now doing their own their own PhDs in whatever field they want, so they can be they they can now start to utilize more of that brain, start to focus on themselves rather than living vicariously through their favorite bloody housewife or football star, and actually realize how special they are and how important they are. And actually, wait a minute. It wasn't a big bang that went off and then single cell organisms then started to come around and blah 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 and don't believe in you know a a, a monolithic you know all-seeing creator force no just think about yourself <laughs> after you die that's it you know accumulate as much money as possible live as low and base level as you can and everything will be everything it's not the way to be <laughs> we we are special we are so so special and these wicked space monkeys are doing everything to show us that well we're not special we're just ordinary yeah you know we've got aliens all over the place we've got <laughs> we've got all these different stuff going on we're just a speck of dust you know on this little rock somewhere no <laughs> no there's, there's nothing out there there are there are dimensions. Um, there's clearly other dimensions and stuff. As far as little green men on planet Centurion, I'm not too sure about that kind of stuff, personally. <laughs> personally, me either. I'm not buying it. I, I would say they've always been here, the demons. Um, yes. They're in disembodied form right now, but they're trying their damnedest to get back here in physical form. They never left, you see. Um, they can't leave the Earth once they die. They're not, they're not allocated to heaven. They're just allocated for destruction in the end. Um, and they, their waiting place, their purgatory, the rein, the place where their soul is constantly reincarnated is back here on Earth, you know. Um, and they have worked with human beings in secret societies who are kind of their foot soldiers, you know, in the physical yeah. realm, all orchestrated by higher powers and principalities. The fallen angelic rebellion never ended, you know, and they use their children in the spirit realm, the Nephilim, to corrupt us, manipulate us. Uh, they love to inhabit our bodies because they haven't got one. Yes. So they can experience pleasures of the flesh and they manipulate us to do things in order to placate them, not to give ourselves yeah. pleasure. And they use our senses to feel things. You know, that's possession in its, in its purest form. In fact, pure, pure possession is where you don't even know they're there. You know, that's what they're re that's what they're really aiming for, you know, to make you think that you want to do all that stuff and you're doing it for you, you know. Exactly. Um, and then the step further, Paul, is when you've got these and I and I and my heart goes out to these people, you know, who have lost a loved one and they'll go to these soothsayers who will who will allegedly allegedly make contact with their relative on the other side. Yeah, not know. knowing that they've got a demon in their presence whispering sweet nothing to, to, to this poor person who's who's just seeking a bit of closure to be close to their loved one and they're talking to a demon in ha allowing a demon to make that connection thinking it's their loved one yeah well that's the ancestor spirit worship coming back in it's all a lie now the difference is we think we're actually talking to grandma and granddad in the west yeah you know but in other cultures they know they're talking to demons and they're trying to get powers from demons I mean, this is what I mean. These these channels or mediums, you know, these ones who are communicating with uh, your dead father, 
let's say, they just literally have a demon there telling them what to say. Because yeah. that, that demon has watched you your entire life. It knows exactly. everything about you. It knows everything your father said to you before he died. It knows everything. It was there. It watched. And it's been on here for thousands of years. It knows mm -hmm. more than you will ever know about humanity and the way we think and feel. And that's where the medium gets his power from. You know, he gets it from the demon he works with and probably gives sacrifices to and lets the demon come into his body so he can do stuff and feel the pleasure or whatever. You know, there's a deal. Yeah. There's a deal there. There's a back and forth yeah. being made. And in return, the the medium gets to seem like he has magical powers to an ignorant person. Absolutely. You know, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all lies. It's all based in, in your naivety and ignorance. You know, the less you know, the more, pow the more power they have. That's the whole point of secret societies. That's why it's a secret, you know. Um, but yeah, that one really gets up, grinds my gears as well. It's 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 a disgusting um, trick. It, yeah. Trick, it really is. It's pervasive. It's so so pervasive because you get one person, and 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 it, it's the referral thing. Oh yeah, so we've done that. You know, I got to speak to to my cousin, and you know, I spoke to my great great grandmother, and it's really interesting because I'm finding out my own history now. But because she, wow, I can learn about my my family history as well. And the, it, the domino effect happens, and then you then we then move over to oh well, Sarah, she's um, she's not right, you know, she's she's talking to herself and stuff. Oh yeah, it it, it changes the person. Yeah, it, it changes the person. Yeah, I'm in hospital for because she's mentally ill. Not that she's possessed by demons or she's she's communing with demons. She's mentally ill. No, I'm not saying that there, do, there are not people who are mentally ill. I'm not <laughs> saying that whatsoever. But what I am saying is there are many people who are demon possessed who are classed as mentally ill. They're bipolar. They've got multiple personalities. Is oh yeah, demons. That's true. Yeah, no, I do. I do see that quite a lot as well. Uh, Jerry Marzinski. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's a um, a, psych a psychiatrist who worked heavily in the prison system um dealing with schizophrenics specifically yes um and yeah he he has come to the conclusion himself that no these people are demon possessed you know and they, even they know it you know and that's and the and these entities within them react specifically in the same ways to certain stimuli including the bible and things like that you know what i mean and the, the consciousness the, they are their own individual consciousnesses within people you know they are they are entities with thoughts and feelings <laughs> or oh, they are individuals within another individual. It's not just some kind of weird uh, psychological defect of some kind. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Or chemical imbalance. It, it's yeah. Something it's scary. That. It really is scary. Um, Paul, I don't want to take up any more of your time. It is, it is, it has been a thoroughly entertaining um conversation i would definitely like to go into more detail reference your your specific because we touch a little bit on the nephilim clown stuff but i definitely want to have you back to go into some more detail we can hash that out um oh, yeah sure two two questions before you depart sir go seriously have you had fun tonight i have it's been nice to talk about something else other than the clowns to be honest <laughs> yeah it's uh it's just it's, it's, it's different it's different i like it excellent excellent my last question for you sir is please tell us who you are but do not tell us your name senor who am i um mm. i am the reluctant world expert on clown mythology now That's, there we go that's who i've become um but but fundamentally i'm just a, i'm just i'm just some guy with some with some ideas yeah. Yeah. Please throw out all your social medias and I'll make sure I put them down in the description below, sir. I will do. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, you can find me on YouTube. That's where I am predominantly, but I, I'm on all the other platforms, Twitter, BitChute, Odyssey. Um, I have a GoFundMe for the book and I'm also on Telegram if you're interested. Excellent. As I say, I will make sure I put the links below. If you are interested in this topic and you want to support Paul Reference, this um, up and coming book, Links below, follow it, like, comment, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend to jump on the train. <laughs> Thank you. Adios. Reporting stopped.